Rich, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, and Governor, thank you for the, uh, um, the admiralship. I did not expect to uh, leave Nebraska today um, as a, a seaman, but uh, I, I appreciate that. And uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Butler, uh, Beitler, I'm sorry, um, members of the, the chamber and guests. Um, when Wendy asked me to join you today, I quickly agreed. I never pass up a chance to visit my family and friends. My mom and my Aunt Judy are sitting over here, and my brother Mike's and sister-in-law Amy are in the room. But even more than that, I never pass a chance to pass through my favorite drive throughs at Amigos and Runza. And yes, I do that every time I'm here. So thank you for having me back home to Nebraska. Um, Lincoln looks great. We've heard it a lot, and you all live here every day, so you see it. But someone like me comes back from time to time. I was back in mid-December to uh, um, for something at the university, then I was back at Christmas time, and every time I come back, it seems to look better, certainly since I left here um, in 1996. Come back several times a year, usually at fall uh, football games, so it's a little bit warmer out, but um, everything really uh, looks great. Over Christmas, I was able to um, have a tour of the arena. I had a hard hat on, and I went in there for about an hour and a half, and I'm sure a lot of you have been in it and have seen it, but one thing that I am really looking forward to when it opens is that pizza oven. I don't know if you've seen it. It's right in the middle of the top floor. It's just this huge round pizza oven, so I'm not sure who's going to get the, the uh, vendor um, ship for that, but it uh, looks great. Um, I do have one regret, though. However, um, when I was looking in the haymarket and driving around the haymarket during my visit at Christmas time, I thought, I wish I would have bought that apartment that I had right above Barry's Bar, right to the <laughs> left of it. The address was uh, uh, 227 North 9th Street, I think. I lived there for my last year of college. I could have made a little money on that now, I think, because it, uh, the haymarket is, is certainly thriving and it will continue to. So anyway, it's great to be back home in Nebraska. So it's, it's the end of January. And the first month of the new year is already behind us, surprisingly. And as you know, President Obama was just inaugurated. Uh, the 113th session of Congress is settled into its routines and its rhythms, and Republicans are in charge of the House, and Democrats are in charge of the Senate. So it seemed like a good opportunity and good timing to bring you a report about the progress taking uh, place in Washington and this new spirit of uh, cooperation that has broken out across the Capitol from Washington, uh, throughout Washington, from the White House to Congress. But then I decided that would be a very, very, very short speech. <laughs> so we'll diverge a little bit. But in all seriousness, there is actually plenty to write about so far this year. Um, and there's even more to talk about. But even if there wasn't, that probably wouldn't stop someone like me, who now, I guess, is guilty of being uh, part of this never-ending a news cycle on television and on the radio. There are 24 hours in each day, and unfortunately, some of my friends and colleagues in the media think the First Amendment suggested that each one of those hours must be filled with analysis, observation, and opinion. So I promise not to take an hour. I'll just take a few minutes, and then I really look forward to opening this up and having a conversation. We'll take any hard questions. I've interviewed several people in the room over the years when I was a reporter, so now is your chance to fire back at me. But. Um, I guess let's begin with a couple um, important topics. As the governor said, um, former Senator Hagel is appearing before the Senate Armed Services Committee today, and I was upstairs just uh, about an hour and a half ago watching the grilling that was underway by Senator McCain, and you'll definitely want to check this out on the news tonight because it was uh, pretty extraordinary, probably the most intense exchange I've ever seen uh, between um, a senator, a friend, a former senator, um, and Senator McCain was drilling down, trying to get Senator Hagel to answer one question, if he was uh, still believed that his opposition to the surge in Iraq was correct. And he said, were you correct or incorrect when, the surge, when you said the surge was the worst um, uh, act in uh, American foreign policy? Hagel tried to explain and tried to launch into the uh, talk of killing time in the Senate. McCain... Uh, cut him off, and he said, are you going to answer the question, Senator Hagel? So that's what I think will be on the soundbite tonight on the news. Are you going to answer my question, Senator Hagel? So we'll see what happens here. I think Senator McCain's vote is going to make it easier for other Republicans to support him. But nonetheless, uh, I would be surprised if he's not confirmed. Uh, we'll find out um, when the uh, vote takes place in this committee on Monday, probably. But Kind of interestingly, what's happening here um, sort of speaks to what's happening in Washington. Almost half of the senators who will vote for his confirmation, 43 senators are new since Senator Hagel left uh, the Senate. 
And he only left uh, in January of 2009. His term ended in 08, as you all know. And so almost half of the Senate has turned over since that time. So I think that explains a lot of, for what's going on, a lot of new faces, a lot of, um, not, mu not many relationships anymore um, in Washington. But um, McCain has not exactly tipped his hand, but I was talking to one of his advisors a couple days ago. He said he's going to give him a hell of a hard time, but at the end of the day, he wouldn't be surprised if he votes for him. So we'll be watching that. But I think the, I think the relationship between, uh, between a Senator McCain and Hegel is one of those intriguing Washington stories that at least the press loves. I love it. My first beat at the New York Times was to cover a Congress in 2006, and the Iraq War debate at the time was driving all of the discussion on Capitol Hill, and the disagreements were very pronounced between Senator McCain and Senator Hegel. And remember, this is the person Senator McCain once called Hegel, John McCain without the attitude problem. <laughs> so. These guys had adjoining offices in the Russell Senate office building, and they talked all the time. They were back and forth between their offices. But I was doing a story on their kind of fracturing relationship in, at the beginning, at the early part of 2007, and I was interviewing them both separately in their offices, and I was struck that they both had the same photograph in their office. The two were standing on either side, and President George W. Bush was right in the middle. And it was autographed by President Bush, and it said, I am the rose between two thorns. And of course, those senators were, were famous for giving President Bush a very hard time on his appointments, on his policies, and everything else. So um, I still think there's a bit of that old bond between those two old soldiers. So we'll see how, um, how that plays out. But I was thinking of, that, uh, of those photographs when I was standing in the East Room of the White House earlier this uh, year, just about three weeks ago on January 7th, when President Obama nominated Senator Hagel for Defense Secretary. And I was waiting for the, for the uh, announcement to begin. A few reporters were asking me what people um, in a Nebraska were thinking about Senator Hagel. And I said, it's complicated. Um, and then I passed along the uh, phone number of Mark Falson, the chairman of the Republican Party, because <laughs> Mark certainly loves to uh, um, give his view on this. But it was this 1996 Senate campaign. It was the first Senate race I had ever covered, and all of you remember, it was quite a doozy. I was working part-time at the Associated Press and at the Lincoln Journal Star, and it got me absolutely hooked on politics. Um, one thing that's uh, left out of my, um, the uh, bio that I use uh, and that uh, was read at the beginning of this was actually my first daily newspaper job was not at the, at the Des Moines Register or the Lincoln Journal Star. It was about an hour west of here at a newspaper that looks like the New York Times, but it's a little bit inversed, the York News Times. <laughs> so I covered sports and news and other things for the York News Times. And when I was interviewing for my job at the New York Times um, in Times Square, I was going through my final round of interviews. I was in the corner office with the executive editor of the paper. I thought, I wonder if this is the time to bring up that I worked at the York News Times. <laughs> but it's probably too hard to explain, and he wouldn't be as amused as I was, but uh, I have always been very, now I'm very amused, and if I was to do it over again, I would absolutely bring it up. In fact, I mention it all the time. I have a, a York News Times thing sitting on my desk. I think that what I've learned being away from Nebraska is that my connection to Nebraska has actually grown stronger, and I don't think I'm unique in that. Um, um, I remember, uh, and I actually, I think I started to realize this um, when I was sitting in the living room of Ted Sorensen. He was an early supporter of, of then Senator Obama was running for president, and I interviewed him, and he said, you're the young man from Nebraska. And his, by that point, his eyesight was failing him, but uh, one of his assistants would read the newspaper to him every day. And so he said, come visit me sometime. I'm like, absolutely. So I went up to see him, and he talked to me about how his connection to Nebraska had grown stronger over the years. So it really is true when I say I love Nebraska and I get back as much as I can. But one of my... I think the best privileges of my job is having a front row seat to history. Um, while I'm not in Washington to witness Senator Hagel's hearing, you know, the hearings uh, are interesting when Senator McCain is sparring at him, but the rest of them are pretty boring, actually, so I'm happy to be here. But um, I did have a great vantage point to something else recently in Washington, a pretty historic event, the presidential inauguration. And I normally steer clear of taking sides in any political events. I've learned that, um, and it's not in my nature. But if you promise to keep it confined to this room, I will give you one opinion from that day. I do not believe Beyonce was singing the national anthem. <laughs> I, was, I was sitting about a few rows back from the uh, Marine Band that day, and my first clue was 
the uh, woodwind players uh, did not have holes in their gloves. They put their gloves back on. The rest of the time, they had their gloves off were playing. And the guy who was playing the cymbals was not crashing during this Tar Spangled Banner. So Beyonce, she looked great, and she was about 20 yards away from me. Um, it just didn't look like she was quite singing. And of course, the media, my friends in the media, um, blew the story out of uh, proportion, but thankfully only for a week or so. So, um, but I wasn't here, didn't, um, I didn't come here to talk about Beyonce, although she's back at the Super Bowl on Sunday. So uh, we'll see if she sings then. But, um, <laughs> and I am looking forward to taking your, your questions about Washington and politics. But before then, um, here are a couple things I'm keeping my eye on this year as the year uh, begins. Several people ask, what does a political reporter do in a non-campaign year? Well, the answer to that is, uh, you know, it's always a campaign year, as those of you who have run for public office realize. But a couple things, I would say four things I'm focusing on watching this year. I would say President Obama's second term agenda is at the top of the list. The rebuilding of the Republican Party is also on the list. The changing demographics of our country. And of course, 2016, because it's never too soon for people like me to look ahead to the next election. We call it job security. But most of our time in Washington is spent talking about the second term. And the Constitution, of course, gives, gives this president and every president four years, but the political reality gives them a lot, a lot to less than that, probably only maybe a year. So that's why you're seeing some activity now on immigration and other things. We can talk about um, about that in a second, but I wrote a story the day after the inauguration saying just that. The Constitution gives President Obama four years, but the political reality is much different. And I was expecting my phone to ring the next morning from the White House. You can set your watch to President Obama's reading schedule. His aides, of course, read stories when they, um, whenever they're published online, but he is still generally a newspaper reader. And during the first term, when I was covering the White House every day, I was over there every day for the briefings and things, um, often angering them and getting on, um, under their skin. You could set your watch by the time he read the newspaper. He goes to the gym in the morning at his house, has breakfast, and around 8 or 8.30, if you would get an email or a phone call from Robert Gibbs, he was then the White House press secretary, you knew that the president had read the paper. So there's some small nuance that only like he would know or something. So his skin was pretty thin back then. I think it's uh, thickened up a little bit. Um, of course it has to. Um, but one thing that I found out when I was researching this story, how much time do second term presidents have, was that uh, he has been spending a lot of time looking at second term presidents and how they've been successful, how they've not been successful. He's spent a lot of time looking at George W. Bush's administration. And of course, it wasn't that long ago, um, in the second term in 2005, President Bush, he tried to do social security reform and immigration reform at the same time. Neither one of them happened. So we don't know the answer yet to the question of if if some of these measures will be different this time, if immigration reform will happen, if gun control measures will happen. But uh, President Obama has been talking to historians. He has had a lot of presidential historians in to try and talk about uh, how he can make his second term better than some other second terms have gone. So the, he hopes to accomplish immigration reform. And like I said, it was a little interesting this week when you saw after he was in Las Vegas, uh, uh, giving an immigration speech on Tuesday, I believe it was. And for, I think, the first time I can remember, at least in a little while, John McCain said, I liked what the president had to say. Um, at the same time, President Obama was pretty, uh, you know, he said he was open to this uh, Senate plan. So I think that something may be afoot here. Of course, we'll find out. But the biggest clue to me that this immigration debate is different this time around is what uh, Rush Limbaugh said on Tuesday. He was interviewing Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, and he was pretty open to um, some of these reform proposals. So I think one of the reasons is the times are just totally different. Republicans have a newfound urgency to do something on immigration reform. The status or the demographics in this country are changing. And if you look at these statistics from the past few election cycles, in 2004, George W. Bush won 40% of the Hispanic vote. In 2012, Mitt Romney won 27% of the Hispanic vote. But even more of a problem, since Hispanics now make up a larger share of the electorate, his, uh, his poor performance was even more damaging. So there's no question the mood is, is, uh, is shifting, at least in Washington. But we do travel around the country a lot to hear how things are actually you know, sort of being viewed in things. It's not going to be easy, and who knows if they'll get it together. But I think that the uh, suspicion of of some Republicans of this, and even some Democrats of this. It's, it's definitely a bipartisan suspicion. It seems to have gone away a little bit. So um, 
One of the suggestions out there is that uh, Democrats want to make immigration reform um, so impossible for Republicans to vote for that it will look like Republicans have blocked this agenda and that President Obama really does not want immigration reform. I think that's not true. President Obama, is, I believe, is more concerned about his own legacy and he needs to have some kind of accomplishment in the second term. Um, so I think that he'll probably be more accommodating on this than some Democrats would like him to be. But other key items on the agenda this um, uh, so far this spring, obviously, are gun control after the a uh, horrific shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. The public approval to me seems very high for some of these uh, proposals. Um, I was going to do a PowerPoint presentation, Frank Lunt style, with a bunch of um, you know, uh, poll numbers and things, but I will spare you all that and just read you a couple um, things. Um, I thought that Frank Lunt's joke would work better, but I guess it didn't. <laughs> um, a Gallup poll last week showed that 91%, 91% of Americans support requiring some type of criminal background checks. 67% of Americans, according to Gallup, support outlawing armor-piercing bullets. 60% of Americans support reinstating or strengthening the assault weapons ban that was in law from 94 to 2004, and 54% uh, support um, limiting the sale of magazines to 10 rounds or less. So obviously, there is support for some type of a, of a gun control measure. We'll see how that goes, but that is one of the agenda items that I'm watching for this year. Um, moving on, what is the future of the Republican Party? We ask this question, of course, because the losing party, at least in the race for the White House, always goes under a period of, of examination and, you know, how can they rebuild their brand, et cetera. The Democrats were doing the exact same thing in 19, uh, 1988, 1992. But in Nebraska, of course, it seems like a kind of a silly question because the future of the Republican Party to me seems very bright here. But um, that's not necessarily the, the, the case all over the the country. But a week after the election, last November, I flew to Las Vegas for a meeting of the Republican Governors Association. I ran into Haley Barber, the former Mississippi governor, who's probably the wisest, or one of the wisest uh, sages in Republican politics. And I said, Governor, what do you think Republicans need to do to win back the White House and become a stronger party? He said, we need to give our political organization a proctological exam. <laughs> and I was taken back a bit that uh, Governor Barber used the word proctological exam, and I said, how so? And he said, we need to look everywhere. From top to bottom, a full review, we need to be brutally honest about the problems in our party. So the proctological exam is underway, and I'll let you know the results. But, um, <clears throat> But that conversation is underway. I think a lot of governors, a lot of Republican governors, Republicans have a very strong bench across the country, much more so than Democrats. And Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin, he told me that same week, he thinks Republicans should sort of not change their principles, but change how they talk about things, change their tone. Governor Bob McDonnell of Virginia, he said the Democrats just do a better job arguing about the economy. And last week at the Republican National Committee meeting I was at in Charlotte, North Carolina, Governor Bobby Jindal of Louisiana said, you may have... Uh, seen this. He said, we as a party need to stop, we need to stop being this stupid party. We've had a number of Republicans damage the brand this year with offensive and bizarre comments. And we've had enough of that. So him saying the stupid party thing, I think it touched off a lot of conversation, but um, we'll see where it goes with that. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> see, I'm used to writing, not talking, but <clears throat> so Republicans are six seats, only six seats away from winning control of the Senate. And, and the test will obviously come next year in the Republican primaries. And the biggest question is what will happen in these primary debates? In these, you know, is, are Republicans in some states going to nominate a strong candidate or perhaps not? An early test of this will be in Iowa, just across the, the Missouri River over here. Tom Harkin announced he surprised a lot of people saying he's going to retire. So that open Senate seat will be the most or one of the most important to watch in the country, which is good, which means I can come back to Iowa, Nebraska anytime I want. So I guarantee there'll be a lot of visits in my future next fall during football season. But in any case, <laughs> finally, 2016. I don't know if any of you were watching 60 Minutes last uh, Sunday when President Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton were sitting side by side. They were laughing and they were smiling. I can assure you Vice President Biden was watching somewhere. Um, and he wonders, he wonders when it's going to be his turn for that type of 60 Minutes treatment. We'll, 
we'll see. But um, that was interesting. Of course, the biggest question in political circles is will Hillary Clinton run for office? Who knows? We're going to be asking that for a year. We're not going to have an answer for probably a year and a half. So I have made a pact with my, my bosses and editors. We're not going to write about this until 2014 or 2015. I'm sure we'll blow that. I have no doubt we'll blow that and not do it. But for now, who knows? But one thing about the Republican side, again, there is a very, very strong Republican bench. These things happen in cycles and waves. And there's, of course, a Marco Rubio. There's a Chris Christie. There's maybe a Jeb Bush. There's a Paul Ryan, a Bobby Jindal. The list goes on and on and on. So it only takes one candidate and one winning election to uh, change the fortunes of a party. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so all of these observations are based on reporting. I've actually talked to people and, and report and talked to party leaders either on the phone or in person all day long. So I have tried to spare you my opinions here today. But... Um, of course, we learn in journalism schools, some of my distinguished former professors are here, we're not supposed to have opinions. I know that no one believes that, because how can you not have opinions? But it's true, this may be controversial, I don't vote in races that I cover. I do vote in other races that I don't cover, like the mayor of Washington, D.C., or the city council, because they make property tax decisions. But we actually don't, <laughs> we aren't supposed to have opinions on things, but I know some people who find that very hard to believe. So I had an example of that happened last fall. And um, I try and convince people that we do have a bias, actually. And a bias for a reporter is for a good story. We love a good story, regardless of who's on the other end of it, our bias is for a good story. So I was flying from Colorado to Ohio. It was the day after the first presidential debate uh, last October. I noticed that the almost the entire plane from Denver to Columbus was a lot of people had Nebraska red on and Nebraska sweatshirts on. Well, they were doing the same thing I was doing, uh, going to Columbus, Ohio for the Ohio State game. I, of course, was going there to report on Ohio as a battleground and go to the football game. But um, just in case my company expense account, people are still reviewing my expense account. But I, uh, So I was, I was sitting next to someone who asked if he could borrow my um, stack of newspapers. I was reading the Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Denver Post, whatever. I gave him the New York Times. He kind of turned up his nose. And he said, I'd rather read the Wall Street Journal. I said, well, what's wrong with the New York Times? So he proceeded to tell me, well, normally I'd never strike up conversations with people on airplanes, especially if it's a two-hour flight. I'm trying to get work done. And I would never tell people, especially someone who looks like he has an opinion, uh, that I work at the New York Times. But I thought, what the hell? He has a Nebraska sweatshirt on. I'm going to do a little, a little test on him. So I said, I actually work at the New York Times. This front page story about the debate last night is my story. I'm Jeff Zeleny. He said, really? He said, or I asked him, I said, where do you think I'm from? New York? I said, no, Nebraska. He said, I bet you went to school in the East Coast. No, nope, Nebraska. And then I told him I also appear on Fox News on Sunday. <laughs> and he, is, he was, his, all his stereotypes, I think, were were sort of disassembled and, and thrown out about. But then he had a question for me. He said, how many of your colleagues, if they had a great story that could topple this presidency, this was October 3rd, so this was still a month before the election was over, how many of your colleagues, if they had a great story that could topple the Obama administration and presidency, would hold off and not publish it before the election? I said, I've been in this business almost 20 years. I do not know any reporter who would hold off on that. He said, I don't believe you. I think, you, I think the media wants to get him elected. And I was like, have you ever heard of Woodward and Bernstein? I mean, what reporter of my generation or younger or older would not want to topple an administration if there was something there to go after? I mean, of course, we're not looking for things that aren't there. And he, I think by the end of our two-hour flight, we talked the entire way. <clears throat> he lives in California. He's from, um, from Nebraska. I think he finally, I think I made a little bit of impression on him. I'm not sure. We'll see. But... I thought of that exchange one morning last week when I was doing Morning Joe on MSNBC. And to do those shows, you have to do arrive early and be in a makeup chair. It's kind of, it's kind of odd, but it's you know, um, just one of those things. You look better on TV with makeup. So I was sitting in basically a barber's chair with this smock over me, and some woman was doing uh, makeup. And the person right next to me was Bob Woodward. He was going on after, after me. He's a very, very nice guy. I know him a little bit just around town being in Washington. He's been very friendly. And we were, he was on, their speak, on the show speaking about second-term presidents. And he was talking about how Ronald Reagan had Iran-Contra, how Bill Clinton had Monica Lewinsky, and other presidents obviously had scandals in their second term. And he asked me if I thought, 
that Obama would have a second term scandal. And suddenly I got nervous as it dawned on me that I'm now expected to be competing with Bob Woodward. <laughs> so uh, that makes me nervous for the second term, but I better get back to work. In any case, um, <clears throat> that's all I have, but I would love to answer your questions. If you guys have any questions, there are microphones back there and over there. And if not, uh, I'm going to ask some of you all questions, person by person. So I hope you have questions. I'm going to take another drink of water here so I can keep going. Looks like we have one over here. Hi, Jeff. Welcome back to Lincoln. Thank you. I had to look Lincoln up on the map when I moved here. Um, I have a question for you in regards to immigration reform. Uh, I'm a doctoral candidate and I'm originally from Iran. One thing I know is that majority of the people that are getting advanced degrees in universities in the United States are from other countries. And majority are choosing to return to their home countries because of the immigration situation in the US. How do you think that affects us in terms of a brain drain, number one, and number two, being able to compete globally? I think that is a great question, and it's really at the center of some of the debate. And it's things like that that I think there'll be bipartisan support for, you know, the H-1B-1 visas. Uh, Tom Friedman, uh, a colleague of mine at the New York Times, has written so many times, and others, you should staple a green card or something on the back of a PhD uh, degree or a master's degree, because we clearly are losing um, a lot of talented people. It is one of the, the centerpieces of the bipartisan reform, and that's actually going on a separate track. Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah is leading that. Marco Rubio is also involved, and there's also some Democratic support. So I think something like that is likely to happen. If it's a pathway to citizenship or in just immediate to legal status, I think it will be something, because it seems crazy not to. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jane Raybould, Lancaster County Commissioner, and two years ago, the Daily Beast rank Nebraska number 47 out of 50 states in terms of tolerance. And the question to you, do you think we've improved our rankings? Because we're certainly proud of all the other improvements and advancements that we can showcase today. But do you think being a, being a Nebraskan, if we've improved in terms of being more tolerant? That's a great question. I didn't see that ranking. I'll have to go check it out. Um, I don't know the answer to that uh, because I have not, uh, I don't spend every day here and I'm not sure how tolerant Nebraska or Lincoln has become. I certainly wouldn't th think it's you know, in the top 10 or anything, but I also think that you know, the face of Lincoln has changed and the face of Omaha has changed and Nebraska has changed. So my guess is that you know, there obviously are growing pains of a changing population, um, but if you try, I've spent a little bit of time in you know, your Lexingtons and your other towns across the state you know, that have had a diverse population for a while. My guess is it's more tolerant than it was 10 years ago, but I doubt it's as, as tolerant as it should be. But uh, in terms of ranking, um, who knows if it's grown up or not. Yes, sir. Hi, Jeff. Um, you'd, you'd mentioned kind of the constant news cycle around elections, and some of us think that's part of the problem in Washington, D.C., uh, that they're constantly running for election. Is, is there anything under the radar relative to maybe changing terms or addressing that issue that you're aware of? I do think that is part of the problem. Everyone is always running for a re-election, especially in the House of Representatives, where the minute you win, you have to start running again and raising money. Um, but the simple answer, or short answer, no, I don't believe there would be any um, change in you know, how long um, the terms would be. That would be a constitutional thing. I think the only thing that, uh, that could potentially happen is that both parties just kind of have a bit of a detente for, you know, some of this year. Um, because people who are running don't want to be running as early as they are, but they're running because the other side is running. But my guess is that we're sort of stuck on a, a path we're going toward, and it will probably stay the same. Yes? Admiral, we thank you for coming. Thank you, Professor. Uh, what impact does the internet and social media have on your profession, and what issues do you think it poses for elections, political coverage, our way of government, our way of life? 
It's a great question. I think the, I mean, the internet and you know, the news cycle and news in general has changed so much. When I left Lincoln, I thought, I'm a newspaper reporter. You know, now uh, we, we all do everything. I think one thing the internet has done on the positive side is opened so much information up to people. I mean, it used to be a, you know, the media basically, you know, controlled everything that uh, you received. Now people can research things on their own and find things out. I'm not sure that's happening as much as it should be. I think people go to their um, channels that they already believe in. But I think in terms of elections, one thing that I, I did pick up last week from Republicans at the Republican National Committee meeting in North Carolina, where Republicans from across the country were sort of assessing one thing, they were trying to figure out how to reverse engineer the Obama campaign strategy on social media. I think that the Obama campaign did a very good job of connecting with people through social media, Facebook primarily, and other things. So I think that has had a potentially a, a positive impact because it does give people a better sense of community. Overall, the news cycle is, is uh, revolving, it's uh, it constant, but I think it gives um, news organizations more responsibility to sort things out for you all. You all are very busy people. It's our job in the media to sort of tell you what happened today, why it happened, connect all these dots. So I think in some respects, we're actually, there's more of a need for you know, the old um, mainstream media, if you, I uh, hate that expression, but that's, everyone knows what I'm talking about, you know, to sign of uh, order things and say, this is what happened yesterday, this is what should happen, et cetera. So, um, but on the whole, I mean, it's easy to say, it's obviously not been good for my newspaper industry. You all see what's happening with newspapers and other things, but if people have more information, I think it's sort of hard to go wrong on that. The burden is on us to decide, uh, you know, how to um, use it well. Yes, sir. Jeff, I'm Dave Bundy. I'm the editor at the Lincoln Journal Star. And if you're interested in coming back, we've got a nighttime cops and courts position. I love that job. That was so great. Do you still have the big cell phone that you put in your back pocket? With we can thing? find I love that for job. A uh, question I have for you is you've, you've been on political talk shows on both sides of the spectrum. Um, is all the political chatter helping or hindering real political discussions that are solutions oriented? It's certainly not helping. I mean, I think if it was helping, there's so much chatter out there that uh, things would be resolved and you know, there would be a lot more accomplishments. I'm not sure that it's hurting. I think that it's mainly just a filling air time. Um, I guess overall, I think that the, the, uh, the news coverage and how it's become so partisan where conservatives go to Fox for their news and liberals go to MSNBC for their news as opposed to being you know, perhaps more open-minded, I think that is not a good development. I think, you know, and one of the things I mentioned earlier about the change in makeup of the Senate, it is just uh, there are not many members of the Senate anymore or Congress who, you know, who will cross the aisle and do bipartisan things. It's, it's, a, new, it's a new Congress, so we'll see if that happens this year. So I, I think the whole, uh, you know, uh, separating of the media has not been good. But I'm not sure you can blame the everything on, you know, the talking heads and things. I think it's, just, I think it's a filling space. But, you know, the, the, the Tea Party movement in 2010 was without a question, was at least, I think it was already out there, you know, and that sentiment was there. But when Rick Santelli from CNBC had his sort of rant on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, I think, you know, in the middle of the day, and so we're not going to take it anymore, that did sort of spark something. So I'm not sure if that was a positive or a negative development. I think you could argue either way. But, uh, um, again, I think it's one of those things that's not going away. Yes, sir. Yeah, Jeff, Nick, Nick Cusick, uh, welcome to Lincoln. Um, Thank you. As a local business owner, I, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts would be on two related questions. One, there's a lot of talk about whether the Democrats and the Republicans can get together to get anything done and build any consensus. But there's very little conversation about the possibility ever of any kind of a strong third party. And of course, there's been ebbs and flows, a little bit of traction here and there. But my first question is, do you think that ever has any possibility of happening? And the second is, would it be a good thing or a bad thing? in your view in Washington, D.C.? I think it could have some potential of happening. I mean, it would depend on the, uh, who was doing it. But you know, say Mayor Bloomberg in New York City decided that he was going to really run and create a third party. Well, he would be an immediate force, obviously, because he has money and he could, he could drive it. He's decided to not do that. And he's decided to try and influence the, the current process by trying to elect Republicans or Democrats who believe in his philosophy on gun control and things. So I think that is a sign that it's very difficult. Look, I mean, the structure is, is, is as it is. There is a Republican Party and a Democratic Party controlling Congress. I think it would probably work only at, at the presidential level. I don't think it would work as well um, 
in the uh, Congress or at the uh, local level. But if there was a presidential candidate, you know, like a Bloomberg, who could appeal to both sides, if people get so fed up with partisanship and they don't uh, f find that either the Republican or Democrat are sort of answering their questions and filling a need, I think that could happen. But I think only sort of at the presidential level. But boy, you have to have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed to get on the ballot in places and other things. So this would have to be a well-planned out effort. And there are some, uh, some groups underway talking about, about this. Uh, um, you know, trying to move beyond partisanship, but it couldn't be something that just happened on a whim. It would have to uh, take a bit of planning and the uh, right candidate who probably had, you know, a big check to write. So I think I'm getting the hook from Wendy here. So um, I really appreciate the invitation to come back to Lincoln. I've, uh, I've done Amigos. I need to hit Runza, and then I'm going to uh, fly back.